As the winds of war swept across Europe a century ago, a young woman explored the war-ravaged battlefields of the Western Front. For six months, she encountered Allied troops amid the slaughter and stalemate of the Great War. As her voice rose above the din of combat, little did she know that her actions would initiate an exchange of ideas in supporting troop morale that is with us now a century later. Though largely forgotten today, her memoirs of World War I are perhaps best characterized by a stanza from Lieutenant Colonel John McRae's epic poem, In Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. Elsie Bierbauer was born on March 16, 1889, in Columbus, Ohio. First stepping onto the stage at the age of four, by the time she was 10, she was performing for President McKinley in the White House, before touring on vaudeville at age 11 is little Elsie. Throughout her childhood, her mother Janice helped to guide her career and would accompany her on her vaudeville tours. It was on the vaudeville circuit that she took the stage name of Elsie Janice, derived from her mother's first name. She soon appeared on Broadway at the age of 16, headlining in one of the most popular plays of the era, the Vanderbilt Cup, in 1906. In the late 19th century, political and military alliances began to polarize Europe. A growing arms race between England and Germany spread to other nations by the end of the century. Political volatility in the Balkans earned the region the nickname the Powder Keg of Europe. Following the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand by Serbian nationalist Gavrio Princip in Sarajevo on June 28, 1914, nations of Europe mobilized for war. While the United States attempted to remain neutral, Elsie Janice's involvement in World War I began in 1914 as well. While appearing in the passing show in London, she watched England's young men march off singing, It's a Long Way to Tipperary. Unfortunately, the war would claim her fiancé, British actor Basil Hallam, who was killed in the first months of the conflict. Upon returning to the United States in 1915, Janice created a vaudeville act that doubled as a recruiting tool by singing arrangements of patriotic songs in an effort to raise funds for Liberty Bonds. Following the United States declaration of war in 1917, Elsie Janice and her mother took a passenger liner to Europe in 1918 with the sole intention of performing for Allied troops fighting in France. Elsie Janice explored the trench environment in ways that were both typical and atypical for a civilian along the Western Front. On the one hand, she was really atypical because she had a chauffeur, she had license to go where she wanted, she had a lot of independence, and that was really unusual. Um, something that was maybe more typical was that she was mostly in rest areas, so an area a few miles behind the lines. This meant that she could hear explosions, she could see them, uh, she has a few sort of near misses in terms of sharpshooters. She explores and experiences the trenches in terms of all the bad things, um, the discomforts, the weather, the, the wounding. She's certainly seen plenty of soldiers being wounded. Um, but for the most part, she is seeing this war as a bit of, a, of an adventure. But Janice was not only exploring the war zones. She was exploring a new definition of support for those in the military. From Paris to the front lines of the tool sector, the Doughboys appreciated how Elsie Janice cut short her music hall successes to bring her talents to the troops, sometimes doing nine 45-minute shows a day. In just six months, Elsie Janice would make over 600 appearances and would be given the title of Honorary Commanding Officer. The men of the American Expeditionary Forces, from privates to generals, were indeed heartened by her brave, touching, and patriotic encounters with them, and dubbed her the sweetheart of the AEF. Elsie Janice was clearly in the vanguard, a standard bearer of entertaining troops overseas, and 
Although certainly lesser known, she was the one that got it all started. Soldiers loved her and encountered with her was interactive. She began every show with this, this uh, call out to them, are we downhearted? Soldiers would shout back no. And everybody sort of waited for the end when there would be these sing-alongs with her. So the encounter was a very personal moment for most individuals. And then the press uh, just covered her with lavish praise. Um, people learned about her. She was one of the most famous people during the First World War. And in that sense, the encounter with her was a shared experience for Americans during the First World War. During the Great War, when women served as nurses, ambulance drivers, and telephone operators, Elsie Janis organized and financed her own mission to entertain and support Allied soldiers before the creation of the USO and independent of the assistance of the YMCA or the Red Cross. She described her encounters with the soldiers of the AEF as the greatest experience of her life. Finally, at the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, the Great War was over. In all, nine million men had died, forever a testament to the ruin of rage. After returning home to the United States, Elsie Janis wrote about her wartime encounters in The Big Show, My Six Months with the American Expeditionary Forces in 1919. We laughed and even sang. I told them all my new stories and sang anything they asked for and felt really useful to humanity for the first time in my life. We see her in this book really cultivating the persona that made her so popular. She is the comrade in arms. There is a kind of pathos in how she describes the experience of singing to these soldiers and then maybe a few short hours watching them heading to the front lines, maybe to their deaths. Following the war, she wrote and produced a new stage review entitled Elsie Janis and Her Gang, a show that was inspired by her wartime encounters and included a cast of ex-servicemen, and recreated them in a 1926 Vitaphone musical short film entitled Behind the Lines. Differing perspectives questioned her motives. Very few suggested that she was attempting to advance her career. Perhaps this point of view is not entirely without merit. However, in the years following the Great War, her dedication to those in the armed services remained resolute, long after the headline ceased. When her mother passed away in 1932, Elsie Janis retired from the stage. The only appearance she made were for members of the service. Elsie Janis's encounters with Allied troops during World War I began an exchange of ideas in supporting troop morale that served as the model for the development of the United Service Organization in 1941. President Roosevelt founded the USO in 1941, and he was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy during World War I, uh, prior to becoming president. And I have no doubt that Elsie Janis's performances made an impact on him, and he remembered that. And as he saw the clouds of war coming in 1941, he realized what a difference that made for our troops. During World War II, she was again drawn to the service and sacrifice of American troops frequently visiting the National Soldiers' Home in West Los Angeles, appearing with emerging film stars who continued what she began in 1918. Exploring war zones and encountering troops in exchange for their appreciation guaranteed that these programs would continue in the years following her six months in France. When Elsie Janis died on February 26, 1956, vaudeville and early film star Mary Pickford said, This ends the vaudevillian era. She is privately interred in the Great Mausoleum at Forest Lawn in Glendale, California. Since her efforts on the front lines in France a century ago, performers from Bob Hope to Martha Ray and Jay Leno have followed her lead by performing in combat zones around the world. Today, as people pass her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, most have long forgotten Elsie Janis to the rigors of time. And while her name has long faded from the flashing billboards of vaudeville, Broadway, and Hollywood, as the first American entertainer to explore war zones with the purpose of entertaining troops. Her encounters with them would lead to an exchange of ideas in developing programs to increase the morale of American soldiers fighting abroad that remains with us today. Even now, a century later, scarce heard amid the guns below, the larks, still bravely singing, fly.